What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., Claudia Bellafato in the DraftKings studio in Boston. We got a great show for you guys today. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us. Leave us a five-star rating and check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern. And, of course, the best of Gojo and Golik on noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you get VSIN on the radio. Claudia, what do we got coming up today? Well, if us East Coasters can stay awake for this one, we got a full slate. Of course, we'll talk about last night's game, but plenty of football. Thomas Morstead will join us live, the Jets punter, to break down the upcoming season. We'll get a Masters preview in, joined by Michael Eves live from Augusta. And the path of win totality. Yes, we are not done talking about the solar eclipse, <laughs> but we're going to get some NFL in there. But as promised, we have to talk about the fact that UConn is back-to-back -back champ, 75-60 to 60 win over over Purdue, the first team to go back-to-back -back since Florida 17 years ago. Average scoring margin this tournament, over 23 points, 12 straight NCAA tournaments wins by at least 10 points dating back to last season. We sort of knew it all along, guys. It was always UConn Gojo, let's be real. It, it was. It was what felt like the most obvious answer this entire tournament, Dad, for a team that won by an average of 20 points in last year's tournament run to a title with Dan Hurley wearing the same underwear that he's wearing in this tournament, and now this year, 23 points per game margin of victory for what has to be, and Dan Hurley has said it himself, the most dominant two-year run in men's college basketball history. And I think any time, Dad, you're compared to the UCLA teams and the John Wooden era, it's kind of like in being in, you know, uh, 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 Wilt Chamberlain stat in the NBA, you know you're in rarefied air and you're doing something right, and UConn's found their way back into that place. Yeah, you're right. Uh, getting mentioned with, with John Wooden and UCLA because those are eras that will never happen again. I believe Wooden and UCLA won seven straight uh, at one point. So that that's not going to happen anymore. So you're right. When you can be in that same breath in other conversations with what your team has done and what UConn has done overall, which we'll get into uh, is fascinating, but it's such a complete team, right? They're, they're just, you never felt like they were getting challenged. It was what, 36 30 at halftime, and it didn't even feel that close because all per all basically, uh, UConn said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll cover our big man against your big man, let Zach Eady go off, which he did for 37 points in this one, getting the ball down low. We'll just cover the perimeter. We're not gonna. We're not gonna let you bomb from the outside. They took just seven threes. They've been averaging what, 15 threes a game or something like that. They took. They took just seven and made just one. So UConn has the strategy, but Claudia, they have the ability and the players to go ahead and carry that strategy out. Well, they're deeper. I think that's what it came down to. Yesterday, I walked into my apartment complex, and the mailman asked me. He goes, "Who do you have tonight?" And at the time, I really hadn't placed a bet, and I said. You know what? The issue is Purdue just only has one guy. They only have Edie, and you saw that. He put up 37. The other contributions, 12, 5, 4, and 2. And that's what I said. I said, that's why UConn is going to win. Yes, they're, they're more talented overall, but they have more guys that can shoot and score, and I think that's what it came down, down to, Gojo. 
eerily reminiscent of the conversation we had on the women's side about South Carolina versus Iowa and the difference between those two teams. And that manifests itself in a 37 to nothing discrepancy in bench points in that game. But you're right. For UConn, it's both the depth and also I just think the makeup of the team. We talked yesterday about Dan Hurley's assessment of building a championship squad like this in the transfer portal era and the fact that you did have some mix of that in addition to Stefan Castle, a star freshman for you. Donovan Klingon, obviously a sophomore and NBA hopeful, a guy that we expect to probably be a part of the draft this year, but seniors like Tristan Newton, who goes back to back as being the best player in the championship game for this team, they had a little bit of something for everybody in terms of the style, the experience level on this team, and it got them to the point, Dad, where I mentioned that comparison with UCLA, UConn became the third team to win multiple title games by 15 plus points, and just the second team to do it in consecutive years, joining UCLA from 1967 to 69, according to ESPN stats and info that's uncommon this is all uncommon for UConn and the fact that they made it look so easy and ho-hum dad where we never felt like they were threatened even when Purdue had them in single digits or even when in the semifinal Alabama challenged them and got it to single digits it never felt like it was in you know at risk of being anything other than an eventual UConn win where they just outlast these teams well, well, yeah, and, and each game can be different. And what I think what Claudia said really sums it up. I never feel like they could get back in the game. They have anybody else scoring. One other player in double digits. I mean, that's that that's basically what UConn said. We're going to let your guy go off and Zach Eady, and we're going to stop everybody else. So that was their game plan, and it worked to perfection. I mean, and, we, we, and you said it before, but let's continue to give some love to Tristan Newton. You mentioned it. Back-to-back years, last year against San Diego State, 19-10-4. This year, 25-7. and I mean, he's of a, of a great team. He's, he's the man. He's kind of that trigger man. He's the guy that it all kind of runs through. But they're so fundamentally sound, Like I can't say that enough, and it sounds so unsexy, but they just are. You know, and, and, and that's from Dan Hurley and, and what he teaches and that coaching family uh, with his brother Bob coaching over at, at, at Arizona State and the dad and what he has done. I mean, this is a, a, a fundamental family, and that's what they teach, and that's what they coach, and they get the players. Uh, now, there was a little bit of a, a, a quiet spot for UConn, you know, when Jim Calhoun left, but, you know, they rose back up a bit then, and now we're back up again, so... Uh, they are back doing what they do. It's just amazing because, Mike, we lived there for how many years that Stores Connecticut just produced so many championship teams uh, out of that little area from around the country. I mean, you can make the argument that UConn's run in the 21st century is the most impressive run in sports, considering they have won titles across multiple coaches in an era that's not supposed to support that in a place that, as you said, and I kept saying this to people last night because there aren't a lot of people from Connecticut that live out here, so I feel like I need to spread the gospel for everyone. You go to stores, Connecticut, it's cow pies. It smells like manure there. It's a very yep. rural area. It's not a gorgeous campus by any means, and it's not a place that you think should be able to sustain everything it has but men's and women's college basketball it has been the dominant force of this time over that time period and won all six of its national championships across three coaches in a way that just does not feel like the norm in an area where yes we've talked about we've seen the UCLA's go on runs like that Billy Donovan as Dan Hurley pointed out won with a Florida team that basically returned everybody this UConn team we talked about it with South Carolina hockey line changed a bunch of guys into this team that were in more important roles than they were last year and uh so dan hurley who is also an interesting charismatic character at the center of all of this i feel like is a lot more giving of emotion and himself than most coaches are currently step to the microphone to say the obvious again last night after this game to share the court with uh you know with 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 matt painter and, and purdue uh, you know, one of the top programs in the country, one of the best coaches in the country, and uh, you know, just total class, uh, you know, class uh, personified uh, across the board with, with, with those guys. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, what could you say? We won by a lot again. 
can't help himself. He cannot help himself no. when he gets the opportunity to troll or throw a joke in there. That's what this dude does. I was dying laughing last night, Dad. Zach Eady sets a hard screen, I think, in that towards the end of the first half of this yes. game. And you see Dan Hurley walking out, kind of saying something to him in the midst of that game. Like, he really is as bold and brash as I can remember, especially a coach that I kind of associate being on the younger side in quite some time. Yeah, he definitely he gets out on the court when he's allowed to, and sometimes when he's not allowed to to make his point. Uh, like I said, I I I love his coaching style, and much like South Carolina, you know, when you get a team that that's that good, and you have younger players, some of the younger players who aren't maybe playing as as much to keep them there, right? And just what Dawn Staley did in South Carolina, she gets the ladies to come back, you know, and not hit the portal. I know they brought in, uh, they had at least one one of their top players who, who had brought in. It, it's going to happen. But for the most part, if you can keep your players and the players see the winning and see the development, you know, you're, they're less apt to have as much movement on teams like those than you are other teams. And so it creates the possibility of the word and it's i feel like the meme it's yeah. the Kansas City Chiefs the Yukon Huskies teams openly talking about three-peating Claudia because that's what Yukon's in line to do right now according to a lot of the sports books and certainly according to their head coach Dan Hurley yeah, and you mentioned it earlier, back-to-back -back titles. They would be the first since the NCAA expanded in 1985. Senior, you mentioned this one. You were right, seven straight titles under John Wooden. That was the only team to three-peat in 67-73. And Dan Hurley talked about sort of being in that group, what that means. I think it's up there in terms of the greatest two-year runs that a program's maybe ever had, just because uh, of everything we lost from last year's team. Um, to lose that much and, and uh, again, to do what we did again, uh, you know, it, it's got to be as, two, uh, as, as, as impressive a two-year run as the program's had uh, since prior to whoever did it before Duke. Um, to me, it is more impressive than what Florida and Duke did um, b because they brought back their entire teams and, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we, lost, <laughs> we lost some major players. They did, and they revamped, and they were very successful. He mentioned Duke. Duke is actually the favorite to win it all next year, 10-1. to 1. UConn right behind them at 12-1. to 1. Somebody asked Hurley after the game, too, what do you think about that Kentucky job? Maybe will you take that over? And he just laughed, guys, because why would you? After what you did the last two years, why would that even be a thought, Gojo? I completely agree to go down now at the current state of Kentucky where the expectations are going to be otherworldly, where the resources are no doubt great and you're a blue blood program, a tradition rich one in college basketball. You're you can't, I mean, we had this conversation last year around this Huskies team. That's a blue blood, Dad, in college basketball. UConn is the modern blue blood in yep. the sport, and Dan Hurley is at the helm of a winning Death Star right now with no reason to go and court the kind of other chaos that comes with taking a job like Kentucky, especially coming off John Calipari, where they just ran a dude out of town who had the number one class in basketball yep. and has had a top five class each of the last six years, had him in the final four every other year. We're getting to a point now where that stuff matters, I think, less and less when you can create the kind of circumstance and really, I mean, benefit from the circumstance that Jim Calhoun laid there at Connecticut that's now benefited yeah. Kevin Ollie and now Dan Hurley. You know, just just you know, financially keep him right up there where he should be, right? I mean, that's that's UConn's only job right now is to don't don't do anything that would screw that part of it up. Keep him happy financially, which they should for what he's done. Uh, because you know other teams would at least try to throw some money at him. It was interesting. As Claudia mentioned, Duke's the favorite last year. Well, they had the number one class. I watched some of the McDonald's All-American game. The number one player in the country, uh, this, this forward, this Cooper flag cuter, brought the ball up at times as well. Yeah. He is amazing. But they had they have an incredible – it's almost like the Kentucky thing where they're bringing in – you know, they have five early signees that are like top players – uh, and, and you wonder how many of them are going to be one and duns, uh, but they really loaded up. It looks Kentucky esque for the players they're bringing in. It'll be interesting how many of them are on the court, you know, to start out the season. Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to another interesting point around college basketball because Cal leaving 
Kentucky kind of feels like another one of those moments we've talked about a lot in college football, how people have been pointing to coaching departures and older coaches deciding to retire in that sport because of all the changes that are involved in the new version of the sport. And I think Cal leaving Kentucky feels like a big thing there. And looking around the landscape of the sport right now, where we're watching Jay Wright commentate on the tournament, where you're looking at Dan Hurley as kind of the new face of coaching in college basketball and just kind of the state of things, Dad. I, I Shout out to David Hellman, who I was watching the game with last night from uh, Fox Sports, pointed out that UConn's won all six of their national championships since the last time we had a Pac-12 team in Arizona win in 1997. They've won five of their six since the last time uh, a Big Ten team has won the title in Michigan State in 2000. And it made me think, like, Tom Izzo, probably the last of the true figurehead coaches yeah. that we've got in yeah. college basketball, right? And a guy who has sort of found himself in that Mike Tomlin range of, well, you know you're going to be competitive every year when they get around the tournament. We all kind of expect, hey, they'll be competitive. They'll be a tough athlete. Out, but we've kind of not broached anything remotely close to winning a championship in what feels like long enough to wonder if we can even expect that to happen anymore. You know, from the Big Ten side, you, you mentioned the last Big Ten title, 2000 Michigan State. It's now 24 years. That's 24 years since the Big Ten has won a title. They've had eight chances, and they're 0 8 in those chances. So they can't close the deal with Purdue and Zach Eady, your two time national player of the year. You know, this was this was kind of his moment to, you know, Purdue hadn't been there in so long. This was kind of his moment to be the man the last couple of years, much like Caitlin Clark in, in being, you know, who she was the last couple of years and setting all the records this year, uh, not trying to close out their careers with titles, right? It's the only thing escaping both of them. Caitlin, obviously, with the better numbers overall in you know, from her side of it, but Edie's still considered the best player, you know, the Naismith winner, the player of the year the last couple of years. Neither one able to close out that deal and get that national championship. So tough way for them to end. Great individual stuff, but, uh, you know, you, you want that team thing. Anybody who's been in a team sport, man, uh, it, it's to, to win that championship, that, that's obviously got to be it. And again, we always talk about winning it in this sport in particular. Tough and chaotic. Single elimination, massive tournament of this side. Hardly ever rewards the best team. I've always said, March Madness is a fun model for picking a champion. It's something that we all love watching as viewers. It's a very poor model for finding the best team in college basketball. Or in general, when you don't have a series-based sport in one that requires as much volume as basketball, hockey, and some of these other sports do, you're kind of forsaking picking the best champion for picking the funnest champion. And yeah, funnest is a word. And so for UConn to do what they've done in back-to-back -back years, especially this year, where they've been largely viewed as the best team in the sport and going into the tournament were the one seed, to go and capture that is insane. And then to peel back the layer even more and look at what UConn's done overall, men's and women's in the 21st century. I mean, Dad, you've got two years in 2004 and 2014 where the men and women won both titles. You can barely go more yep. than a four-year stretch without one of those two programs winning a title in stores and again I'll keep going back to the UConn men's program has done this now through Jim Calhoun Kevin Ollie notching one and Dan Hurley notching two championships in this in this time since 1999 and I don't feel like we see that happen in a lot of places where someone's able to come in and seem the only thing that registers in that same way dad is probably like LSU or Ohio State football and really I would lean more towards LSU in that where you look at the last three coaches have all won a national championship during that time period and so it's kind of a recognition that this is a really difficult thing to do because again you think of LSU then they're in a talent rich area they're in the southeast they're in Louisiana that's got all these great homegrown athletes again growing up in Connecticut Donovan Klingon is the outlier having a homegrown native son from Connecticut come and be one of the stars of your team ain't something that happens very often so I, I know we've been talking about men's college basketball kind of searching for something to sink our teeth into I, I do think there needs to be a recognition that what UConn has done just simply should not exist exist and the fact that it does is incredible yeah and and Hurley at, at this you know is making the the case that he's not going anywhere his quotes are amazing uh, did you see the quote about Unreal. the possibility of going to Kentucky I mean mm -hmm. just just amazing uh he said 
about going to Kentucky, and he brings in his wife, who's from New Jersey. He said, oh, my God, Kentucky or anywhere that's going to take her further from New Jersey? I mean, we just went to Rhode Island, which I had to drag her then to Connecticut to get her closer, and now further? He said, I can't afford a divorce right now. I just started making money. I mean, <laughs> dude, is unbelievable. But he said, he goes, think about what we can do here. Just all everything they've done. Now winning three in a row, he basically said, uh, it's like a dynasty in modern times. He said, that's what I'm thinking about. And he's right. Just like we're talking about it with the Chiefs, we'll be talking about it with UConn. Now Dan Hurley just needs to go out and buy a different pair of underwear. Like, that's the... Well. That's the only thing that didn't pass the vibe check. And I understand, like, as a former sports guy, deeply sportsy. We talked about it. I had the same undershirt that I wore to practice every day during my senior season when we went undefeated. I understand being superstitious to an extent here. But I cannot imagine, even with his wife, and for anyone that missed it, I think it was Tracy Wolfson told this story during the tournament, that Dan Hurley wore the same pair of Red Dragon underwear from last year's NCAA tournament that they won in this year's tournament, and his wife bought a portable washer to hand wash these things or whatever by themselves here i still with all that care dad can't imagine those underpants are in good condition i can't i just won't no no buy a new pair time new season new pair that's what you got to do new season new pair we at least need to get eyes on the old pair to pay homage to it congratulations to the yukon huskies your 2024 men's march madness champions on the men's side Well, the power is in your hands, and you have an hour left to vote. It's the one seed, McDonald's fries up against the three seed, Chick-fil-A spicy chicken sandwich. McDonald's fries right now, 58.3%. 
Hannah, very smart. She comments, I really want to vote spicy chicken Sammy over the fries just out of spite, but I'm like Claudia and don't care for spicy things, so it wouldn't make sense. And then if you go down, people are saying you got to talk about, you know, the fries without the sauce, chicken is flat and bland, blah, blah, blah. People are really weighing in on this one, guys, but it does look like fries may run away with it unless in this hour left, people run towards the spicy chicken Sammy. We'll see. Yeah, we got just under 2,000 votes in right now at Gojo and Golik on Twitter if you want to try and swing the balance at this point, Dad. But uh, McDonald's fries, run from it, dread it, <laughs> destiny arrives all the same, and they appear poised to take this thing. And, and I get it about the sauce. I particularly don't use sauce on the, the spicy chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A. I enjoy it without the sauce. Uh, I really do. Uh, but your point is, a lot of uh, Claudia's point is, is a lot of people do use the sauce. And with the fries, now a lot of people use ketchup, but, but you don't really have to with the McDonald's fries. So I could see that be the deciding factor. I, again, I voted uh, spicy chicken. It's going to have a tough time with an hour left to make a comeback here. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to do. And uh, at, at this rate, the blue blood is going to reign supreme. We will see. Me and Claudia both made the same face when we realized you've been eating dry chicken sandwiches out here. A little worried about <laughs> You're you. You're just out here... Raw it's good. It. <laughs> you mean every? Do you do you mean every piece of chicken you've ever eaten has needed some sort of yes. condiment on it? One thousand. Really? I mean, you know I what? Eat. Then you're getting food some chicken. But the issue is, like, the bread makes it dry, and because it's breaded, it's extra dry. So that actually blows my mind that you don't put sauce on it. You need to change that. Well, Dad, that. to your no, point about the quality all. of chicken, like, if you've grilled a nice piece of chicken or made it at home or yeah. something or get it at a restaurant where you know, okay, it's prepared with a little TLC, this is all fast food chicken. And I understand we've talked about Chick-fil-A having different yeah. standards in there, a militant approach to customer service that's clearly leaked into the voting here. It's still fast food chicken, which means every once in a while it's going to have a touch of the dries here and that's where the special sauce comes into play and so well, you dabble in the sauce sometimes are you always listen, just out here raw smacking this chicken <laughs> every now and then every now and then i don't feel like mcdonald's salts their fries enough and i need ketchup on them you know the the, the sure. fries aren't made perfectly every time just like the chicken spicy sometimes you said is dry there are times i've had the mcdonald's fry and i haven't liked them you know i, I didn't like mm. the way they were prepared so i oh. needed ketchup on them so i, I could say the same thing there Oh, that wasn't my issue, though. I, like, I'm fully, like, I love dipping stuff in ketchup. I think te ketchup, properly rated condiment, that it's fantastic. It pairs with a lot of things. I have some misgivings with the crowd like Mahomes that puts it on steaks. But when it comes to fries, no, I like to get copious amounts in there. Now, McDonald's fries also have the distinction of being something you can eat without any of it, especially when you get the good golden brown right. ones in there. But you just made it sound like you were never dipping into the sauce of the chicken sandwich, and that worried us a little bit. No, no, no. I, I dip sometimes just because I love the taste okay. of that of that uh, sauce. There's no doubt about it. Oh. One of the great things about fries is when you get the bag, if you go drive through and you get the bag in the car, a lot of times you don't want to eat your sandwich in the car. Not us. We eat our sandwiches in the car. But you can reach in and pick out and eat fries while you're driving. Uh -huh. You know, it's a the good snack while you're going. You don't have to wait on those. And then it's your the car most smells humbling like thing McDonald's you then get for home. four hours. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> So true. I say it's the most humbling thing when you get home at the end and realize how many of the fries you've actually eaten by doing that one at a time trick well, that you think yeah. is helping you be judicious with them. The, the one thing I and your mother have had to do uh, for a while, that was the biggest thing to get out of the car when you and your brother Jake, who are again 15 months apart, we're in that toddler stage in the back seat, and we'd go through and get McDonald's. We would always hand you guys the fries because they were a very easy snack to eat. And inevitably, the mess you guys made was mostly it was McDonald's fries we had to pick up off the floor. So uh, thank McDonald's for that as well. <laughs> Shout out to a bag of French fries where you can see the grease stains steeping in on the outside yeah. where the bag yeah. starts to sweat a little bit. That's one of the sexiest sights in fast food when you see that bad boy just leaking out all over the place. God, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Uh, Claudia, let's pivot a little bit here uh, and do a little bit more basketball because we were all waiting to see the number that came from the game on Sunday involving the Iowa and South Carolina women. And good Lord in heaven, it did not disappoint. 
And just for the record, you just made me lose my appetite. Uh, but yes, they did set a record. <laughs> 18.7 million on ABC and ESPN. Clark weighed in on the number and she kept it very simple. She tweeted out 18.7 million fire emoji. Yeah, we all have to agree. The most watched basketball game since 2019 when the men's title game between Virginia and Texas Tech averaged 19.6 million. But the only sporting events in the U.S. to draw a bigger TV audience than this game since 2019. Football, the World Cup, and the Olympics. And to be quite honest, with a mix of the timing and also the fact that we didn't really think it was going to be too close of a game last night, I wouldn't be surprised if the women's numbers did better than the men's last night. Senior, am I crazy to think that? No, because last year the number for the women's was a little over 9 million and the men's was, I think, 14 million. Now uh, we are, and, and again, I, can, I get confused at times. This is ABC and ESPN combined, right? Mm -hmm. So because it was, obviously it was on both. So uh, that, that's the number uh, that we're looking at. I, I, I think it's going to outrate the men's. I, 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 and that, that was the talk. Was it going to be able to this year? I don't see the men's mic being over 18-7. No, and it's one of those things where it's kind of a good measuring stick thing, but it doesn't need to be. And I don't think any of us are trying to make it comparative in a way that derives its greatness from that. It's just we know what the conversation has been before. And so the fact that it's staring eye to eye with all the things that Claudia just mentioned now, you look at the national title game, up 89% from last year when Iowa lost to LSU, up 285% over the viewership from South Carolina's last national championship two years ago when they beat UConn. Like, this is a certified rocket ship right now for the women's game over the last couple of seasons. And yes, I understand some of this is certainly attributed to Caitlin Clark herself and the sort of mania that followed yeah. her. It was very Steph Curry-esque in the way that she became this one-woman barnstorming show. But I think we've seen there's proof of concept around the sport now with all of these ratings and the numbers over the tournament, Dad, that even if it takes a slight dip because you're losing a generational player, it's still an insanely yeah. popular game that's yeah. only getting more shine, more platform, Form and better coverage that's going to lead to more people watching. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. We're not making the comparison to say, oh, is one better than the other? We're making the comparison to say how much growth the women's game has made over the last few years. That's that's the key issue here. Um, so it's it, it's been impressive. Uh, one thing that definitely hurts the men's game, I mean, the women's game was on the middle of the afternoon, you know, East Coast time on Sunday. The men's game doesn't start till almost 9.30. Eastern time and, and you oh, know, God. The UConn is in the Eastern time zone. So it, it's a crusher. It just is where Mike, you and I are fortunate enough to be out in the West. So, you know, that game started at six o'clock our time. You're able to stay up and watch it. Claudia, you're out in Boston. As I said, UConn is in Connecticut, obviously. So that's on Eastern time. I mean, that's, it's difficult. You're a fan. You want to stay awake. But, you know, if you're more a casual fan tuning in, you know, you may get tired and say, I'll read about it in the morning, Claudia. I, I, I would have, Claudia, did you make it through the game? Well, am I allowed to lie on here? Because I feel like it's wrong if I say I didn't. But I, I felt secure in the fact that UConn was going to run away with it. Yeah. So, you know, I watched a little. Claudia. I had to be up at 4.30 in the morning. So, no. But I watched but I all think the highlights this morning. <laughs> I think that's experience, but though, point, is representative point, of a lot of people on the East Coast who have yes. all had to get up early for something. And this has yep. been the story of the entire tournament on both sides of the fact that we've got these games going on in the middle of the night, especially as we've gotten later and there have been fewer games and we're still stacking them this late in the night where you've got 9, 20, and 10 o'clock Eastern tip-offs. It's just insane. It's ins I. I I don't know how we get yep. this changed or which congressman we have to write. I know they should be busy with real stuff. They always seem to meddle in sports anyway, and so if we can get them to help us out with this one thing, it's not quite Dad's Daylight Savings Time reform. But, man, for sports fans, it might be just as impactful right now. We need to get these damn tournament games on earlier, and we need to do it fast because you see how well it worked out for the women. Use them as the example. Follow them to freedom.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golik. Dad, we didn't get to talk about this yesterday, but at, on the heels of the ratings discussion around women's college basketball, the the you know overwhelming popularity it's absorbing right now, there was one little moment, and it kind of was the undercurrent of some of the end of this tournament run for Caitlin Clark and her story career is we all devolved into this GOAT debate about if she can be considered one of the greats to ever play the game without a championship, and... A lot of that was, you know, online discourse, but then you had Diana Taurasi, who went on with Scott Van Pelt. Her and Sue Bird had been doing the multi, uh, the simulcast on ESPN during a lot of these Final Four and Championship games, and she had the quote, reality is coming, and talked about the transition that Caitlin's getting ready to make to the next level. Also said that if she was taking the number one overall pick, that she would take Paige Beckards over Caitlin Clark, and... I just wondered if you were a little bit surprised at all, Dad, about the pushback that we saw on Caitlin Clark by some of those inside the game as we got towards the end of this run. I'm surprised at Diana Taurasi and her comments that, yeah, you know, what she can do against 18-year-olds now, you know, the Lee, paraphrasing, saying what she's doing. She, she did say 18-year-olds against 18-year-olds yeah. as opposed to the WNBA. Last I checked, Diana, you played against 18-year-olds as well when you were in college, and 19-year-olds, and 20-year-olds, and 21-year-olds, and some 22-year-olds. She did the exact same thing that you did. Claudia, what's up with the sisterhood out here of, of, of lifting each other up? I mean, it's like some of these women can't wait to tear each other down before they go to the next level. Senior, I was just about to say the same thing, and it's not even like, oh, women supporting women, but it's just, there's no reason. Like, what benefit does that give her to sort of tear Caitlin Clark down? I think it's okay to put a blanket <laughs> statement over the fact that it's going to be tough to make that transition as it is for any league man or woman from yes. college to the pros. But to say her specifically, well, oh, she's going to be in trouble. And Paige Beckers is, I, I take her over number one. Like, I do not understand this. She, she set a record for men's and women's, the most points. Like, you can't deny the number. She held her team. She didn't have much help. So when I heard this, and we've been hearing it from other big voices, right? We talked about how important it was to hear from Don Staley supporting Caitlin Clark. To hear the opposite from other big names is really, really disappointing. And I think this is something that, you know, not to, to gender it too much, because this is men's basketball culture, is the old veterans or the old guard players tearing down current players. It's one thing I hear constantly from basketball media is, hey, it's so strange to have a sport where the older stars seem to go out of their way to try and undercut the current product. And I, I heard the point made on the Dominique Foxworth show yesterday with Dominique and Charlie, his producer, talking about maybe trying to avoid the pitfalls that other leagues have fallen into? Like, does this have to be the way? As we're getting ready to experience, I think, a period of rapid growth for the women's game right now, we've seen and talked about how Caitlin Clark sort of represents the same juncture. It, at least you could kind of make the sort of comparison to what Bird and Magic did for the NBA as a TV product right. back in the day when that rivalry sort of spawned a league that was on the outs as a television product to something that became massive. And this feels like a big growth point now for women's college basketball, Dad. And it's not to say she's got to be universally loved or lauded, but it is an opportunity right. where this is going to mean women's basketball is going to start to get more eyes, investment, and people involved in the sport. And you wonder if that's going to change the way it operates and if we're already seeing that reflected in the comments. Terry. You know, I'm, I'm just, I, I want to go back to what, what Claudia said, and I, and I agree with, is if, you, if you're going to go into the pro in your sport, that means you've played that sport for a long time, and you kind of understand that it's going to be different at each level you're at, and the top level is going to be the hardest. So, you know, there are other sports where players may think that, but it's in the locker room or wherever saying, you know, I'm not letting that rookie get one over on me or whatever. But to, and, and I guess part of it you would have to say, guys, is most of these comments are coming from former UConn players who's, I, sure. and, you know, who's Caitlin's team beat, you know, to get to the final. So maybe there's a little bit of that as well. But I, I have, I'm not going to lie, I've been surprised at – hey, you know, what we've done all the time, let's wait and see what they do. They know it's going to be a tough transition. Caitlin Clark hasn't been talking any. It's one thing if you go in talking like, oh, I dominated in college, and I'm going to go dominate the WNBA. No, nobody, she's not smack talking. So I, I guess I just don't understand. Not that everybody is going to love everybody and you got to welcome everybody in, but, you know, to air that one out uh, was, was definitely a little surprising to me. I think it's one of those things, Dad, where 
you look there's and there's always been a lot of undercurrents to the Caitlin Clark conversation, right? There's been the racial undercurrent of in a sport yeah. predominantly, you know, built by black women to constantly feel like there's this great white hope complex where people are looking for a young white woman to come in and celebrate in this sport. And that's not to say Caitlin Clark wasn't deserving of celebration. I'm saying that this is some of the sentiment and the conversation that seems to be behind this at certain times. But then this idea that, yes, as it's gaining popularity, we know this. It's hard to now in the current discourse because we've got social media, because we've got so many 24-hour news cycles, to feel like we're all having the same conversation at once, right? Where if you're some of these players, if you're a veteran in the WNBA, if you're a former WNBA star, it might seem like if you're listening in certain places that Caitlin Clark is being attributed as the sole reason why women's basketball is experiencing this current right. period of growth and maybe not giving enough credit to the other stars. And when you mistake that for the main conversation and no one else getting credit, I can understand that maybe some of these feelings might creep up. Yeah, I, listen, I get that as well. But we, we I mean, she's the next in a line of great players we've seen in women's college basketball, right? And she'll go down in the team picture as one of the goats. I'm one of those in basketball. We've talked about that. I think a, a national championship goes a long way in goat status, and she doesn't have one, but she's right there, as I said, in the team picture of, of the best ever. And, you know, so she's just the next person that was in line that helps carry this game. Like we kept talking about, you know, Hannah Hidalgo and Juju Watkins and Madison Booker, you know, the three incredible freshmen this year, how they and, and they will be staying in college for a few years. So we'll get to know those names. So it will keep on rolling here. So again, she's just the next in the line and we have no idea what she's going to do at the next level. None. Right? I mean, though it's a shooter's game now in both leagues, and she's a shooter, so the expectation is that she could do well, but we don't know. We, we, we have no idea. It's just a, a wait-and-see approach here. Uh, but I, I see what you're saying, Mike, you know, because the game has been growing for a while, and if everybody is just pointing to Caitlin Clark, you know, that, that certainly I'm sure the other women that came before her may feel slighted a little bit, Claudia. But that's also not her fault. Like, that, that's what would be so frustrating no. to me. If I went out and had this historic season and this historic college career, and I'm all excited to take it to the next level, and then I have everybody around me criticizing me, thinking I'm the one saying, hey, look at me, I was great, I'm the only good player. She's not the one, and I know you guys aren't saying this, but, like, that's more media's fault than anything. That's not her fault, and she just went out here and balled out. <laughs> Well, and I guess that's the thing is like, it, it, it's never all or nothing. And that's where we get in trouble in these conversations is it might sound like to some of the current and former players in the W that it's all being attributed to Caitlin Clark when that's really not the case. There's been plenty of celebration of others along the way here. And for Caitlin Clark, it could feel like that when you're in the eye of the storm, but we've seen an overwhelming amount of support for Caitlin Clark throughout all this, where she has been celebrated at the end of the day. These are always small blips that show up, but depending on the source, it carries a lot more weight. And as she gets ready to make this transition, I'm sure it couldn't have felt good to hear that from someone as revered in the sport as Diana Taurasi, who is considered one of the all-time greats at the college yeah. and the pro level. I will say, we didn't talk about this the other day. The biggest winner, I thought, of this tournament weekend here had to be Aaliyah Boston. Because when you look at Aaliyah Boston, 22 years old, doing what she did, helped anchoring the desk with uh, L. Duncan and Andrea Carter and Chanae and the rest of that great crew, and did a phenomenal job, was interviewing her former head coach in Dawn Staley, got to see her team avenge the national championship loss from last year, and got to see Caitlin Clark ball out, who is more than likely going to be her new teammate with the Indiana Fever when yes. she's taken number one overall. So for Aaliyah, you really got to have your cake and eat it too this past weekend. And by the way, future in broadcasting looks very bright for that young woman. No one has any right to be that good at 22 while they're still playing. We have seen more and more current players get involved uh, in the media when they're out of a tournament or in the offseason or whatever they're, that they want to get involved, and it's a smart thing to do. Mike, when we were finishing up at ESPN, how many current players did we get rolling through to do what they call the car wash, to go on all the shows to try and get those reps while you're playing? It's, it's a great move to do, and she did a, you were right, she did an absolutely phenomenal job.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr. and Mike Golik Sr. And it is one of the most wonderful weeks of the year. It is Masters Week, and uh, that is where we head now to get a little taste of what's getting ready to come up at Augusta. We're joined by ESPN's Michael Eves, who's obviously doing a great job always hosting SportsCenter, but is going to be a big part of the Masters coverage. He's hosting segments down from Augusta. He'll be hosting the two-hour practice round show on Wednesday, starting at 10 a.m. on ESPN+, Plus, as well as player interviews as the weekend gets going. And uh, Michael, where does this rank for you in sports weeks among the calendar year, getting ready to get started down in Augusta? It is my absolute favorite. And it has been, Gojo, even before I came here, uh, started to work for ESPN. As a kid, my dad and I bonded over golf, and I've been a golf nerd my entire life. And this is by far my favorite event. It's my favorite week. It's not my favorite sport. My favorite sport is definitely the NBA and basketball in general. But my favorite event has always been the Masters because it's it's a couple of things. One, to me, it's always felt like the official kickoff to spring, right? I don't care where you live, whether it's in the Northeast or in Kentucky where I grew up or even in California, it's the official kickoff for spring. And also for the golf season because now the clocks have changed. And I grew up in the central time zone, right? So the coverage would go off like 5 o'clock each day. And I still had a couple hours of daylight to go in the backyard and, you know, practice my golf if I wanted to or ride my motorcycle or whatever I want to do. So you just have more time after to go do things. And that's why I think for a long time this has been my favorite sports event on any sports calendar. Before we jump into individual players, which would include Tiger, overall, we know when Liv started there was that animosity and Rory talked about it a lot that kind of kept that alive. We were never sure from the player side where that was. Now the players are all talking about we need to get back together. So from last year at this time, was there some animosity? And right now, is that changed? Oh, the animosity was real last year for sure. Because that was the first time that a lot of those guys had been in the same place at the same time since the split, since the guys left. Because you had Kepka, you had Mickelson, you had Sergio, you had Patrick Reed, right? All those guys, well, three of those four guys I mentioned had had won here, and that's why they were here. Um, but a lot of those guys were also sort of the main vocal people of leaving in, in that regard, and especially Phil Mickelson, the, play, the part he played in it. So that animosity was real, for sure, no question. Now it's not nearly as bad as it was. It's not even close. Um, a, a lot of those emotions have faded a little bit from some of the players. Not all of them. Don't get me wrong. Not all of them. But some of it has faded a little bit. And the fact now that the PJ Tour itself is trying to do business with the same group, the PIF, who funded Live to begin with. Right. So you can't be trying to take money over here and talk trash about the people who got the money first. Right. So a lot of the animosity obviously has died down. It's still interesting to find out where we're going to go with it. But, um, yeah, it's not nearly as bad as it was last year. So that a bit on the back burner this year. Front of mind for everybody uh, certainly is always going to be Tiger Woods the minute he steps foot on this. How much does he change the energy down there, Michael, even in his current state, knowing (laughs) physically how limited he is? It's, it's kind of hard to say, like, you know, we say he, he doesn't move the needle. He is the needle, but, but he is though, man, <laughs> I'm just sorry. Like all eyes are on him, regardless of what he's doing. He, he just has this natural attraction that makes you want to know and see what Tiger Woods is doing. And he was the first player um, on the practice range yesterday, the very first one. And you could see people in the background running over to get a position just to watch him hit balls and warm up. Right. And then he got on the golf course, a little bit, and he always has a crowd when he plays. But it, it's for different reasons, though. One, because of all the past success that he's had, right? He's won here five times. Can he win six? Can he tie Jack Nicholas? Um, that, that's natural entry. But also, we just haven't seen him much. We haven't seen him play much golf. You know, a year ago here, he made the cut, 23 in a row, that tied the all-time record uh, for most consecutive made cuts. But then the next day, it was cold. It was rainy that morning. It was so wet. He was limping. He looked terrible. He walked off with they stopped playing after six holes and he withdrew and we didn't see him again. Right. For a while, we didn't see him again. And then just this year, though, he played one one event, his event there in Los Angeles, the Riviera, played the first round and second round. He left after six or seven holes because he was sick. So we just haven't seen him play much golf. Right. And so you have that intrigue as well. You put it all together, man. Like it's he's by far the most watched a uh, person on the golf course and more questions about Tiger Woods than anybody else. 
Without a doubt. I mean, you just hope he makes it, you're a casual fan, you hope he makes a cut, and then God forbid on yeah. Sunday he's on the first page of the leaderboard. I mean, uh, they talk about ratings. As far as the golfers that we're looking at to, to win this thing, Scotty Scheffler right there. But wh- where are we with Rory now? His last major was 24 years old. Now he's 34. Been 10 years. We thought, is he the next Tiger Woods way back when? But it's been one hell of a drought for him. It has been. And I, I, I think there for a while, Mike, even Rory was asking himself that. Where is Rory? What, what about Rory right now? Um, the last two years, even you know during a lot of that that live controversy where he was basically the face of the of the PJ Tour and and saying so much about it, there were times he was playing really well. Like he played some some good golf, won some good golf tournaments, won the Players a couple years ago. Um, but when he got here or even at the other majors, he just couldn't pull through. Now he's got a lot of demons here, obviously from what happened way back ago. Um, this would be the 11th time he's had a chance to complete the career grand slam. And he just hadn't really come close except maybe two years ago. He kind of, uh, backdoored him, himself into a top two or top three on that Sunday. Um, I, I don't know the answer, Mike, to be quite honest with you. And I, I'm not sure he does like even at, at the Texas open last week, he, he's been doing some new things with his driver and some other aspects of his game. And I think that's why he played the week before to see how that was going. But a couple of rounds, he didn't play well. And then he played great on Sunday. Right, but you need bro, you need four rounds. <laughs> you got you can play well for four <laughs> rounds if you're going to win a major championship, and he just hasn't been able to do it. And I'm not sure what the real answer is to why. And I know he's been searching for that answer, whether it was putting at one point, he was missing greens here, he just can't pull it together. And I don't know if this is the this is a hard place to pull it all together. I'll just say that hard place to pull it all together. So if it's a hard place to pull it all together, then we can look at some of the favorites. Scotty Scheffler, the world number one, the odds-on favorite at most places to win this. Certainly John Rahm coming back as the defending champion now with the live faction of golfers. Who should be the favorite, Michael? And then who's someone you're keeping your eye on that you think has a chance to break into that group this tournament? Scotty Scheffler should definitely be the overwhelming favorite, and he is. I believe his odds right now are the shortest all time, except for Tiger. And maybe Tiger had two or three instances where he was a shorter favorite uh, than Scotty Scheffler. No one in the world has played better than Scotty Scheffler over the last six, eight months. So he should be in the position that he's in. The next best player that behind Scheffler has been Wyndham Clark. And Wyndham Clark would have two other wins if not for Scotty Scheffler. He finished second to him both Bay Hill and the players. But we haven't had a rookie win at Augusta National since 1979. That was Fuzzy Zeller. And it's kind of weird that a U.S. Open champion is coming to Augusta as a rookie uh, here, but that is the case for Wyndham Clark. Um, John Rahm as a defending champion, and also tr- uh, over the course of his career, he has a lower score relative to par than any player uh, during that span. But he hasn't played well this year on live. He had a good finish in the very first event down in Mexico at the beginning of the year, but since then he hasn't played well. Um, I like Brooks Kepka just because I think he's mad he, he lost last year. And when Brooks plays mad or a little upset, he plays well. And I think he won the PJ Championship Gojo last year because he lost the Masters. I really believe that. And so if coming down Magnolia Lane triggers some of that uh, bad feeling from last year, I think that is enough motivation for him to go out there and play really well. All right, Michael, only about 30 seconds left. Pimento cheese, how many of those sandwiches you have? Or are you picking something else? So I love pimento cheese. I grew up eating it. Uh, I used to eat one every day when I first got here. So I would put 10 away easily. Now, though, I only (laughs) allow myself to have them on the weekend. So I only have two. I have one on Saturday and one on Sunday. Wow, nice control. That's impressive self-control there. That's growth, and we love to see that. We love to see Michael Eaves covering the Masters down in Augusta National. Check him out as a part of ESPN's coverage all week long in Augusta. Michael, thanks so much, brother. Enjoy this great week, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. No problem, guys. Good seeing you. Thanks, Michael. I probably need to limit myself similarly, Dad. Went to the doctor's yeah. appointment yesterday. 270 is the number on the scale. Wasn't cute. So me and Michael Eves, uh, yeah. maybe I need to adopt his approach to pimento cheese sandwiches with my lifestyle right now. I imagine uh, I imagine you got talked down a little bit there at 270. Yeah, pimento cheese big there, the egg salad, the pork barbecue, uh, you know, the barbecue potato chips, the cookies, all good stuff. They're all reasonably priced pretty much as well. Uh, there as well, but good control out of him. I don't think I could have that control at the Masters. No, exactly. That's uh, mere mortals impossible, but for Michael Leaves, a veteran of the entire situation, he goes out there and makes the impossible look easy.
Welcome into hour two of Gojo and Golik. The New York Jets, well, this was sort of leaked, but now we know they're expected to show their new logo and uniforms on Monday. In addition to white throwbacks they wore last season, they're adding a green home jersey and black jersey in the same style. So we'll see who's wearing that new uniform when the draft comes around. The Jets are the favorite to select Georgia tight end Brock Bowers with the 10th overall pick. That's at plus 125. Another market at DraftKings shows that offensive lineman is tied with tight end position for them to pick at plus 125. And Gojo, you said you've been hearing some things around the world of Brock Bowers. Yeah, I, I, I think, Dad, he's always been one of the more interesting players in this draft and largely positional value reasons, right? People wonder how early can you take a tight end considering what they cost you in the open market for veteran players and what you have to pay in the first round knowing, hey, you've got guys slotted in here at specific positions. And for Brock Bowers, who's long since been looked at as one of the best prospects in this draft, I saw uh, Tom Fornelli, friend of the show over at, uh, at uh, Cover 3 Pod, talking yesterday about him not being sure if he could be that true two-way tight end, a guy who can go out and be as effective as an inblind blocker as he is as a pass catcher. And I thought we waved by to that as something that was necessary quite some time. I know some people have comped Brock Bowers to George Kittle with the run after the catch stuff. I think that's done him a disservice because – no one's George Kittle when it comes to blocking, and no tight end, I think, needs right, to be right. that. You just need to be willing and able enough for people to have to respect the option, and Brock Bowers overwhelmingly checks those boxes. I completely agree. I, I was reading some of that, and I said, yeah, you know, he's, he's not the blocking tight end, certainly not what George Kittle is and what, what Kittle's been able to do, both blocking and receiving. But uh, you can go ahead and question him. I'll take Brock Bowers on my team. I, I said that from play one when he was a true freshman starting at Georgia, uh, playing against Clemson, and the game plan was basically almost built around him in the passing game. So, uh, impressive. Uh, if somebody wants to doubt him, good by me, and uh, I'll take him, because we've seen the effect of good rookie tight ends and Sam Laporta, Dalton Kincaid from Buffalo as well, that they can come in and produce right away. There's no doubt about it. Well, let's talk to someone who could potentially be Brock Bauer's new teammate right now and go out and welcome in uh, New York Jets newly re-signed punter Thomas Morstead, kind enough to join us now. Uh, uh, Thomas, appreciate the time, man. What is the feeling around this Jets team right now? You guys were talked about quite a lot this last season, this last offseason. So as you get ready for another offseason program for you and another one in Jets uniform here, uh, what's the feeling like around this organization right now for you? Uh, excited, <clears throat> excited to get another crack at the whip. Things didn't go very well for us last year, uh, right from the get go losing Aaron. So, um, yeah, just very excited to have the opportunity. Um, you know, everybody starts out the season zero and zero and, and hope abounds, but I think there's only, a, there's only, you know, 10 to 12 teams that really have a shot every year. And when you really know in your heart that you do have a shot to good, to do something special, it's exciting. So uh, for you, I got to ask personally, for you, what are we at, 16, year 16, 17? I mean, you kind of lose count when you get to this many years. I played with a, with a punter in Jeff Fiegels who ended up uh, punting 22 years in the league. So you're certainly one of the elder statesmen. How has it been personally for you watching this game change from when you first got in the league back in 2009 to now? Yeah, look, number one, Jeff is uh... – Jeff, somebody I looked up to, I shook his hand in 2009 when we played the Giants in the Dome, uh, the Super Bowl season down in New Orleans. And, uh, he about broke my hand. He's a strong dude. Uh, so a lot of respect <laughs> for him. He's got some records that I'm kind of chasing. Um, and so a lot of respect for him. Um, what was the second part of that question? Sorry, I got, I got stuck on just, Jeff there. Just <clears throat> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I, I, Jeff always loves when people talk about Jeff, so he'll be happy to hear that. Uh, <laughs> how the game for you has changed coming in as a rookie in 09 to now going into 2024 season over the years? Yeah, look, the game's changed a lot, um, <clears throat> and it will continue to do so. I'm sure it changed a lot throughout your career and from when you started to when you finished, and um, that's just life, right? Uh, the world's always changing, so I try not to get too uh, – caught up in, in why they're doing this or why they're doing that. It's just, Hey, this is what it is. And, uh, you've got to adjust and figure out how to play the game. Um, I think for me, it's changed a lot from the standpoint that, uh, teams are a lot more conscious about getting faked on, 
you see almost you you almost never have two guys uh, outside on your gunners on both of them. It's never a six box look, almost ever. Um, so it's almost always going to be seven, but more often than not, eight. And um, so it's just changed. That's why you see punt averages higher. You see net punt averages higher because your gunners are singled more more often than not. And um, you know, I think the uh, the uh, you know heavy directional punter with with big hang time you don't you don't see that as a as as em- emphasized as much uh, now. Um, but again, it's the way the game goes, and you got to continue to adjust and figure out ways to be an advantage for your team, or they'll find somebody else. <clears throat> What about for some of the rule changes that we've seen now, even this last offseason, the change to the kickoff in the NFL, certainly the elimination, uh, or at least in the way that we knew it, of the onside kick and the surprise onside kick that obviously you have a hand in one of the most famous moments of all time for that. How did you feel seeing those rule changes now applied this upcoming season? Um, Look, I think as far as getting more action, I mean, it's. I think the touchback percentage was 70-something percent last year. I mean, what, what, why are people spending time watching that? It's it's not an exciting play more often than not. It's just kind of a matter of fact. And so I think um, there's some benefit to making changes and kind of forcing teams to try to um, have returns and, and uh, doing that in a way that, you know, makes the play safer at the same time. Well, I mean, the proof will be in the pudding. We'll see how it goes this year. I do think it's disappointing that a team can't sneak you um, – at any given time. Uh, I just think that's kind of a, that takes the specialness off of the play. Um, I mean, that you don't control that on any other play, right? You can fake punt anytime you want. You can throw up, uh, uh, you can throw a Hail Mary or a toss back, you know, you can do whatever you want, any play and to say, Hey, you're only allowed to do this in the fourth quarter. When you announce it, announce it, it's kind of crummy to me. Um, I'd say the biggest disappointment I have is that, that we really don't feel like we have a seat at the table when they make rule changes like that as players. Um, you know, there's 14 votes on the competition committee and I think the union has one and then there's 13 other guys that are ownership side. So sometimes it kind of feels disingenuous when they say things were done jointly and it's like, ah, you know, you know, there was one vote there. So you guys were going to just do what you were going to do anyway. So hopefully we can continue to push for that to be, um, you know, changed um just the process with which things get changed yeah people think the league and the union every decision is based on mutual agreement by the two and we certainly know it's not that for those that don't remember take us back to you talked about the surprise prize onside kick and uh when you guys played the colts in the super bowl you guys came out in the second half and did that i mean it was it was fantastic to just to kind of make people remember or, or, or come back again to them. Take us through what went on in the halftime when you knew you were coming out and doing that. Well, basically, you know, all year long we were winning and we always said we'd have these fakes planned and we never ran them because we were winning all the time. And so coach had told us the night before the game, we were going to run it. And I just didn't believe him. You know, I just did not believe he would <laughs> actually do that. And, um, and maybe that's why it was such a good call. If, you know, I, even I didn't think we'd do it. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, we came in at halftime, we're down 10, six, we, we haven't played our best ball and we're, and we're hanging in there. So I think everybody's feeling pretty good about it. He, all of a sudden I hear a little cheer from the defensive room and Sean was, uh, making sure those guys had his back and that, Hey, we're going for this. We're not playing to we're not playing to not lose. We're playing to win. And he busts through the doors and walks by my locker and just in passing says, Hey, we're running ambush to start the half. And I didn't have a chance to have a conversation with him. He just in passing. And, <laughs> and, uh, all of a sudden my, uh, my heart rate spiked to probably 180 beats a minute. And I started thinking of all the negative things that could happen if it didn't work out and billion people watching this and, you know, all the things. So, I had a little therapy session with myself uh, in my locker, and um, but I'm glad it, you know those those half times at the Super Bowl are like triple the uh, length of time because of the halftime show. So I had some time to talk myself off the ledge and uh, get myself in a good mindset. And by the time I went out at, at uh, to warm up, um, you know I was excited about it. I was super anxious. So I was, but I you know I was in a better place with it. And uh, the thing that sucks about a surprise is you can't go out and practice it and get it dialed in. Right. You've got to go out and hit, hit a bunch of kicks <laughs> as far as you can. 
get some adrenaline out and then just, um, you know, hope that you hit it just like you did in practice. And, um, anyways, glad I did it. It was an awesome experience and to be a part of new Orleans saints history and the city's history down in new Orleans. Um, it's been a blessing for me for sure. I was going to say the relationship between that city and that team in particular, let alone yeah. the saints overall is, I think one of the most unique in all of sports and certainly that moment, a huge indelible part of that. But you also mentioned there's so much human element in what you just talked about. I think from the outside, so many people look at these football decisions as just cut and dry when to do what now. And we see in this day and age, so many aggressive decisions made in fourth down kind of like that. And I wonder from your perspective as someone who now is, you know, punters in general directly losing out on opportunities to impact the game because we've seen more aggressive fourth down decision making from a lot of these coaches what that conversation <coughs> is like how cued in you and other guys are in this process of when and how these coaches are going to be more aggressive in fourth down situations yeah i think there's two parts to that number one um i mean if you go look at the top paid punter uh you know 15 years ago it's they're the top paid guy was making more than the top paid guy now makes. So that shows you the change wow. in value of punters over time. Um, and look, there's not as many punts, right? Like you said, and um, kickers and punters were ra- roughly the same age uh, or same age, same price tag about 15 years ago. And now it's about, you know, it's they're at least 50, 60% more at the top end. Um, so yeah, the game's changed for sure. Um, and you know, it's just what it is, you know, um, it's crazy to to think about it, but Shane Leckler was making $4 million a year back when the cap was like 118 million. (laughs) I mean, you know, that's crazy, crazy percentage of the cap. And, uh, and so now I think the top guys like three, six and the caps two fifty five. So it's a, it's been a massive, massive change. Um, and, and as far as the other side of that question, you know, I think, no matter what you're, if you're a punter, a kicker, snapper, or any other position that's kind of a specialist, right? You may be a third down guy that comes in as a receiver. You just have to be ready for your name to be called, and and you don't you don't sit here and think, well, if this happens, we could do this, and if this cap, you know, there's a little bit of that as far as just being prepared to play, but um, you know, you just have to be ready at all times and have all the situations. You, the worst thing you can do is go into a play and not have rehearsed that situation in your mind. So you've got to be ready for every situation. And uh, that's why experience counts um, because, you know, we've all been into a, into a, a football play, whether it's high school, college or professional where you get in and you're like, what the hell is going on here? Right. Or you just got caught off guard, your helmet was somewhere else and you know, you're frantic <laughs> and now you're out of your mind. So, um, you know, you just got to be ready at all times. <clears throat> so for you we talked about how long you've been in the league it's a year by year league you can be bad one year really good the next year and then right back sometimes you just don't know you uh, before we get into this year with a lot of moves already made in the offseason we know the moves made last year you go to the Jets last year Aaron Rodgers comes there and all the talk that comes in and how quickly unfortunately it went away four plays into the season take us through last year a little bit and just just how you know it went from the thought of the high that could be down to the low that it ended up unfortunately being. Yeah, look, it was. Um, <clears throat> I guess the first way to answer that question is I was proud to be part of last year's team. Uh, you guys know what it's like when when expectations are here and reality's here. Things can crumble really quickly, and we we hung in there. I mean, the team hung in there. Guys fought their asses off. Um, I was proud to be part of the team. It's not a moral victory thing. It's just, you know, it is what it is. That was the reality of the situation. And I think, you know, think we really, play, I mean, we, we took the Chiefs 23 to 20 in week four. Then we go out to Denver, get a road win. We beat the Eagles, hand them their first loss at home. We go on the bye. We come back and we play the Giants. And um, I think we lost three offensive linemen in that game. And, and after that, man, we really had a hard time um, doing anything on offense. And it just, it was just hard, you know, guys hung in there. I would, like I said, I was proud to be part of the team. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you learn a lot about players when things don't go the way you want and what kind of teammates you have. And, um, you know, it was, it was a cool group of guys to be around. 
So I, I'm excited to have the shot. I know the team will be different next year. It always is. There's always there's new draft picks. People retire. People get cut. And there's new additions. But there's a good core group of guys, and I'm excited to to uh, you know write another chapter in that book and see see where we can take it. And, and I mean, I can tell, I could feel the pride in you talking about last year's team that had to take a lot of slings and arrows. Was that kind of the source? Because I, I think a lot of people, myself included, were surprised. You know, Miko Hardman comes out and says what he says. I know you had a tweet that a lot of people kind of assumed was referencing that situation. Were you, you know, take us through the feelings that led to that, going out and feeling like you had to defend that team and also the commentary you heard from him. Um, yeah, I guess I'll take the assumption out for people. It's exactly what I was referencing. And I just saw what he had to say about coach Boyer and I knew what, I knew what had happened. And I just, you know, coach is a big boy. Uh, he's a grown man. He can, he can stick up for himself, but I just thought it was bullshit. And, um, I just thought somebody did something and. on your life he's one of those people for me um he's he's probably one of the reasons i'm still playing um <clears throat> and why i came back and when you have a relationship like that and you see somebody uh turning the other cheek and staying quiet and not i just felt like i needed to speak up and say something uh just felt like the right thing to do um and i didn't you know, I didn't want to take any shots at him. I just, I just was, you know, it just was enough. And I just didn't, I didn't want to stand for it. And that's all I'd say about it. You know, over the years, I know I've been in the league. I said it many times, listen, the locker room, not all 53 guys and coaches are all singing Kumbaya together. It's kind of like life as well. You take some relationships, you have better relationships with some more than others. And you sound like you had one with your coach. And at some point you just say enough's enough. You know, this is someone I really like and I'm going to fire back a little bit. Uh, so I understood that. As far as going now into this year, so as I said, you've been in a lot of years and each year is different. How does your year start out for you as you get closer and closer to the off-season program and the start to another year? Um, look, every year is a little different. Your body's always changing and you're constantly adjusting how you do things. Um, you know, for me, um, I spend as much time as I can with my family in the off-season. So I'll make a week of OTAs and then I'll be at mini camp. But, you know, I don't, need to get a bunch of uh time in with running routes with Aaron or or um you know I joked three years ago when I got signed week two I was coming off my injury in New Orleans and uh free agent for the first time and and you know I get signed week two I go in and light it up and it's like you know it's not to say that that continuity doesn't matter because it certainly does but um you know you've got to as you get older it's not about you anymore right it's your you have priorities that that you have responsibilities. Um, I've got four kids at home and a fifth one on the way. So, um, I try to, you know, I, I don't, I know I'm not going to regret spending too much time with my, my little youngsters right now. And so I just prioritize that. And, and then when it's, when we're in season, we just all move up together and, uh, we're together and, you know, priority number one is, is ball and doing my job at the highest level and, and, um, being a mentor in the locker room and, well, all while still being a dad, you know? Um, and so it's just, um, you know, you kind of, you kind of have to, you, you know, you talk with the coaches and let them know like how you're thinking things are going to go for you and what your priorities are and what you yep. need. And if it, if it doesn't work for them, you just kind of like, well, I'm not going to be here then, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah. at the end of the day, the reason they've got me coming back is because they trust me. They know that, um, I'm going to continue to be a good leader in the locker room. I'm going to hopefully continue to play at the highest level and, um, and be somebody that's just dependable when they need, when they need a dependable play. Right. Uh, you know, we don't get yep. too many shot cracks of the whip every game. So, um, yep. anyways, I'm looking forward to it. No, and, and we are as well. You've managed to balance all of those things so well for such a long time. And we have no doubt that'll continue into this season. Thomas, appreciate the time, man. Best of luck. We're looking forward to watching you get out there and boom some punts again this fall, man. I appreciate it. Good to see you, man. It's been 10 years. Can you believe it?
here on Gojo and Golik. And yes, of <laughs> course, we have to talk about what happened yesterday. The solar eclipse. We're going to mix some football in with this in a second. But first, I have to ask you guys. Well, I guess you couldn't really see it, you said, Gojo, right? I saw it for a second, but that's the totality of it, right? That's what we're calling it. I did not see that. I also didn't have the glasses, so I might have hurt my retinas. I don't know. But what did you think of it, Gojo? Listen, I'm a firm believer that if you didn't at least try and sneak a little peek at the sun yesterday without the glasses, just to see what all the hype was about there, I don't know if I can trust you yeah. as a person because you're either lying to me because you probably did it or you're shying away from contact. And either way, we can't win with that kind of effort. That's the first thing there. The second thing I'll say, Dad, and I'm curious from your perspective on this is, I feel like unless you were in that path of totality, pretty yeah. mid experience overall. I went down and bumped yeah. some glasses off someone down by the beach. I took a look up at it. It wasn't even close to covering the whole sun and that kind of stunk. But all yeah. these videos of totality that I see look awesome. Look, every bit is like earth shattering and awe inspiring as you would expect a spectacle like this to be. But what was your experience with it? I was very underwhelmed well, listen, understanding that I wasn't in the area yeah. that seemed like it would whelm. Like you in California, me in Arizona, same way. So I didn't, I didn't even go outside to try and check it out. I was too busy watching the channels that were covering in the path of totality and just seeing how pitch dark it got. I was watching the one, one show, and they were at a uh, – all the people at a zoo – that were watching it because they also wanted to see the reaction of the animals, if there was a reaction from the animals. <laughs> And certainly their personalities. Uh, and I, I heard also, you know, a bunch of people saying they made sure they didn't text their exes because of Mercury's retrograde or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm kidding, Claudia. I'm kidding because no. that was unbelievable. No, uh, people no, commented. No. They said, I did feel that urge. No. <laughs> yep. No. They were fighting that, man. Ah. Planetary forces at play oh. trying to get you to make that bad decision. I promise but, it ain't going to work out. <laughs> they haven't changed in either of you. Facts. But you're... you're 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 right, Mike. That if the, and they the one what Odell Beckham was shown from 2017, trying to look at it or whatever. And you're right. If you don't, everybody I think, and maybe not everybody, but I do. You try and sneak a peek to see, you know, will it really burn your retinas? You know, if I look at it. So of course, that's the first thing you do. Hey, that stove is really hot. Don't touch it. So the first thing you do is you see how hot it is by touching it. So we're all going to look at it somehow, some way. But we're in the path of totality. That was very, very cool. No doubt about it. Well, I think the funny part of it, too, was everybody was standing on the rooftops. I could see it in the buildings around me. And you could tell everybody's like, so did it happen? I called my mom. I'm like, wait, did it happen yeah. yet? Do I stay out here watching? Because, ah. like, nothing happens if it's not the totality. So, yeah. I understand what you're saying, Gojo, that it's underwhelming because I saw you tweet that. But um, the fact, I think, that it's not going to happen for a very long time is the cool part of it, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I guess. I think this is kind of like the dunk contest effect, though, where we've seen so much cool stuff and also not cool stuff that's just wild and awe-inspiring that we're sort of a little bit harder to please maybe than we used to be. Mm. And so, I don't know. I need someone out there at uh, in nature Twitter, at Gojo and Golik. I need a top five ranking of natural phenomenon because I don't know if this eclipse falls into that or not. There's so many wild things that happen on the world. Aurora Borealis, I saw lava waterfalls, all of these different things that might usurp this. So echo Joan Golick on Twitter if you're someone that's got that kind of background because we need a little bit of help on there. What we'd instead like to do, Claudia, and a great idea that our producer Slates came up with, the path of win totality. We want to take a look at a couple of NFL teams going into this season and find out what their path is to smashing their win total on DraftKings Sportsbook. Yeah, so the way that we chose these cities was the area where the full eclipse was viewed. Dallas, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and Buffalo were some of them. So like you mentioned, we're going to talk about which team is going to eclipse their win total. And we're going to start with the Dallas Cowboys, who had a very quiet offseason. Their win total set at 10 and a half. So they need 11 or more. Senior, what's it going to take for them to eclipse that? And there's Well, Coach listen, Space. they've been great. They they've been <laughs> let's let's eclipse that, <laughs> shall we? If you're um, not watching, you need to watch because we have a really creepy picture of yeah, you definitely face inside of a sun. I became so. what I always wanted to be, the sun baby from the Teletubby show. I wonder what that baby's doing now. <laughs> Should have had my face as the eclipse going over oh, your that face. That would have been good, yeah.
Yeah, that would have been good. All right, I'm just messing around. Listen, the Cowboys the last three years, we know what they've done in the regular season. And, you know, win, winning the, the, the games they've won, you would think they're going to be over on that 10 and a half, but they barely did anything in the offseason. Now, they had a pretty good regular season team, as we saw, before they got smoked in the playoffs. But is it enough? They really didn't make a whole lot of changes at all. Now, all of a sudden, you start, do you start hearing whispers out of the locker room about Micah Parsons uh, as well? Uh, of, of kind of, is he, is he, is his, I don't want to say act, is, is what he doing wearing thin there? Still, obviously, a great player who I'd love on my team, but it just doesn't all seem, you know, for, for Jerry Jones always saying we're all in, we're all in. They didn't do a damn thing to say they were all in really this year. So I actually have some reservations about that 10.5 number, Mike. I am a little bit less worried about it just because I think the Giants and command like I'm I'm very interested in the commander season and what that's going to entail inside that division. Philadelphia, I think, is capable of making the bounce back. But for Dallas, you, you talked about Micah Parsons. It's going to be really interesting. Mike Zimmer coming down there and the mesh personality wise that he has with Micah, because Micah and Dan Quinn seemed thick as thieves like that was a guy that helped bring Micah Parsons into the league and hone him in this role where he's become the world destroyer now. And so very different different styles in there on a defense that desperately also needs somebody to step up and stop the run. Like one of the few offseason moves they made was bringing Eric Kendricks at linebacker, but like Mozzie Smith, who you drafted last year, who lost 30 pounds out of nowhere, had offseason shoulder surgery. So he's not going to be ready to go till training camp. Like dad, I am worried, especially considering what they might have to do in the draft where offensive line still in need near the top of the draft. Yep. You've got to figure yep. out what you're going to do at running back there. Since Tony Pollard left this offseason, you got a bunch of other needs that pop up, but you still need somebody in the NFC to stop the run. And right now, I don't know if Dallas has a ready answer for that outside of scheme change that's coming with Zim. Yep, yep. And the other teams in this, we can move through the Colts. Another team, Mike, that did not do a whole lot in the offseason at all. They did re-sign Michael Pittman, a good weapon uh, for Anthony Richardson, but that's what we're looking at right now, right? I know they brought in Flacco, but Anthony Richardson, how does he come back from his injury uh, to try and progress to the to the next level of a young quarterback? So I don't see a lot there with, with Cleveland. Unless you, go ahead, you got something on them? No, I was. I, we're going to, I think, tease this over and do this into the next segment, so there's no need to rush uh, through the rest of that because I'd say for Dallas, it sounds like the answer is, hey, you've got to stop the run and then figure out how you're going to reset the run there. Because eventually being as one-dimensional as it felt like they were at the end of the season hindered Dak Prescott. The answer for the Indianapolis Colts and how they get to that win total is simply keep Anthony Richardson healthy. And for a guy that yep. only played in four games last year before they lost him to injury, how they're going to use him? Because, Dad, his best usage is ultimately 2022 Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia. It's the comp everyone thought of when Shane Steichen came over there. And certainly right. seeing him operate in that offense, the things they wanted to do with him as a rusher in the shotgun, using multiple tight end formations, a lot of the heavy RPO stuff that we saw Jalen have the most of his success with, it worked for Anthony Richardson. It was just that you, know, you had the concussion early on in the season, then you obviously had the injury that knocked him out for the rest of the year. It's going to be how do you manage that pitch count knowing the straw that stirs the drink in that offense as a quarterback that does exactly what he does, which is run the ball effectively. It's interesting because that division, we thought it was Jacksonville's after going to the playoffs last year. Then Houston did what they did. We didn't think much about the division. Now we think it's Houston's division. It is Houston's division. And who can, you know, can Jacksonville make that run back up there? Tennessee, new coach. Let's see how they go. They also with the young quarterback of Will Levis, who got more time than Anthony Richardson did with the Colts. They're, they're an enigma. And, and I think that's, they should be because we don't know what Anthony Richardson is going to bring. We saw a little bit of it, but you need some consistency and some continuity there, and that's what they're going to be looking for there. That's the start to see where they're going to go to see how he does. Yeah, it's kind of a one-player issue there when you draft a quarterback where you yep. did, even in a league where we see them moved on from faster than ever. They're still in the hope stage right now with Anthony Richardson as they march on the path towards win totality. Coming up next, we'll take a look at the last two teams on the path of win totality, the Cleveland Browns and the Buffalo Bills heading into 2024 next.
and Golik to continue our conversation of which NFL teams will eclipse their win path of totality, or I guess other way around, path of win totality. Basically, we're taking the solar eclipse, putting it into NFL terms. We talked about the Dallas Cowboys. We talked about the Indianapolis Colts. I didn't really get a, a firm answer, though, from you guys. So Cowboys win total set at 10.5, even money to the over. Colts at 8.5. Gojo, over, under on those two. Which one? I'm going to go over on the Cowboys' win total. I've said until further notice, a team that's shown they can win 12 games a year no matter what for the last three years gets the benefit of the doubt from me in an NFC East where I still really only trust them in Philadelphia. And then, Dad, for the Colts, I'll go under on that one. They won nine games last year. Gardner Minshew comes in, obviously, for the second half of that season. And... I do think there's improvements they have a chance to make through the draft of this roster, maybe adding some depth on offensive or a defensive interior line, some cornerback help, another weapon for Anthony Richardson. But I think part of the admission with Anthony Richardson was always you're going to have to break a few eggs to make an omelet with him. He's a player that I think has a lot of great potential and a great foundation, but just needs the reps to go out there and make some mistakes. And so I think with that's going to come rookie mistakes in his second year because he was robbed of those live game reps this last season. So I'll go under eight and a half in a division that should firmly belong to Houston. I'm going under on both under on the Colts to see until I see what Anthony Richardson is going wow. to do to bring this team back along. So I am down going under just like you on the Colts on this one, the old line two years ago, not very good, got better last year. We'll see where they are this year for the Cowboys. I'm going under as well. I, I just, I just see this team taking a step back and then could possibly be some major changes. You have C.D. Lamb wait for a contract extension now, talking about him not going to many camps or OTAs, which is no big deal, but possibly not showing up for, many, for training camp. That's a thing to keep an eye on. When you have players not showing up for training camp, that especially in these positions of speed and cut and things like that, of cutting is you can get those uh, soft muscle injuries, soft tissue injuries when they finally come back. Uh, because it's very difficult to practice football if you're not playing football. C.D. Lamb, Mike, had over 60 catches more than the next person, which was Jake Ferguson, uh, the, the tight end. So he is that offense. And if there's any issues there, he comes in late that it could affect the season. I just see this team taking a step back. Yeah, it'll be really interesting. I think uh, we forget Dak Prescott was playing really good football for the lion's share of last season up until yep. really the Bills game late in that season. And I, I feel, still think he's capable of that, even if we've kind of reset expectation in his place in the quarterback path in the NFL. Speaking of the path, let's march further down the path of win totality to Cleveland, Dad. The Browns win total at 8.5 for this season. And I know we sort of whittled down Indianapolis to what you're doing to support your young quarterback and Anthony Richardson, but the path to win totality for the Browns basically seems like stay healthy and get Deshaun Watson to play like Joe yeah. Flacco. Do I have that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. And one of the ways of stay healthy is they have a probably a quartet of running backs. They picked up a couple in the offseason. They have a couple of there because I don't think Nick Chubb is going to be ready for the start of the season, suffered that devastating knee injury last year and because he's one of the best running backs in the league. And always that first year coming back from a knee is tough Though some people have done it well. Brees Hall last year did it very well as well. But we have to wait and see. And then, you know, you, you better have some backups ready because Deshaun Watson has not proven trustworthy enough injury-wise. And again, injuries aren't your fault uh, to stay healthy. They had four quarterbacks last year, including Joe Flacco. They're bringing Jameis Winston as the backup now. Yeah. So uh, they, they've been kind of piecemealing it together and got Joe 11 Flacco wins. Based on what he had last season, would they have been better off bringing Flacco back than bringing Jameis in? I don't know. You know, Flacco over time, you know, we saw what happened. Had struggled some, played well some, but struggled some. So I'm I'm not really opposed to this move at all uh, because you don't want your backups to play an entire season. But unfortunately for Cleveland with Deshaun, it's been tough, and they've gone through a bunch of quarterbacks. So uh, I, I think I think it's it's a tough road for them. 11 wins, and the over-under is at, what, 8.5? I'll go over on that again just because they seem to be able to find a way without all their pieces. 
They did. It's going to be sort of the story of that division, right? Because the Bengals are getting Joe Burrow back. Certainly, there's been a lot of change for Baltimore. The Steelers always lurking with an over 500 record in their belt. So this is a tough division for wins to come by. I generally tend to agree with you on the over, Dad, just because of the strength of this roster. But I do worry about some of these injuries adding up. Like your top three offensive tackles on an offensive line that was one of the strength of this team's all left last year with knee injuries and Jed Wills, Jack Conklin, and your backup and uh, one of your draft picks in Dewan Jones. So you've got that group coming back banged up that you're going to need to continue to add depth to. Miles Garrett, defensive player of the year, spent the back end of last season banged up in a way that affected that defense overall. And so there's some worry about, hey, the core of that roster. And oh, by the way, like no one else will probably point this out all that much. Bill Callahan is one of the known commodities of offensive line coach in the NFL, and he now plays for, he coaches for a different team in his son in Tennessee. That's a, not a little thing as you're trying to continue to get this group that's a little banged up to gel together. And so I'll be very curious to see if and what that effect that has on the foundation of that team that's been along both lines of scrimmage that had a Super Bowl caliber roster around their quarterback by and large last year. But it, it's keeping that group healthy and intact and getting Deshaun Watson to play better football is the unfortunate but very easy answer. So I'll go over just because eight and a half seems a little bit too far of a cry from last year given this roster. Dad, the last one, Buffalo ten and a half on their path to win totality here. And this one, this has finally, I think, been payment coming for a team that's roster was aging and spurt in certain spots all along hockey line change in their defensive secondary of some of the names that have been around there for a while the wide receiver room now barren and needs restocking but this is what we saw in the back half of last season a team that can build around Josh Allen being the nuclear option at quarterback we saw Joe Brady lean a lot more on the rushing attack than involved Josh Allen this last year but they got to go out and get him somebody to throw to I know Lad McConkey's a guy that's visited with him during the draft process Process. Maybe they'll move up to take somebody, but as long as they can get a competent wide receiver one in that building, even if they're on the younger side, I have to believe this Bills team is built to go over that win total again. Yeah, I, I would I would think so as well, right? A team that was top 10 uh, in offense, you know, overall rushing and passing, but it is going to come down to, you know, which wide receiver kind of takes over or if it, it seems like it's going to be by committee you know, on how the ball gets spread around. And that could be a good thing if you get to both your tight ends healthy. Uh, you know, if Knox is healthy, got hurt last year, which really opened the door for Kincaid, the rookie who had an excellent year. But if they're both healthy, what that can bring. And their defense, you know, was, was a top 10 defense overall and against the pass, uh, not, not against the run. But, you know, the defense was there. But as you mentioned, a lot of personnel changes. It was kind of like, well, we haven't done it. Some of these guys are aging, so we're going to kind of clear house on this. So let's see what the new pieces do. But they're in that division where Miami obviously lost some players as well. Guys in their secondary, Christian Wilkins gone as well. So they shed some of the players there. Jets, I mean, okay, Aaron's supposed to be back still. You know, uh, we, we're not sure. New England, I'm not counting it at all. So I think because of the division, though, I'm still going over for them, yes. Yeah, I think that's a big part of why. Like, even Miami, there's been a lot of volatility down there. What, their third defensive coordinator in three years? You lose yep. Christian Wilkins in the middle of that team. So many of your pass rushers, we talked about injury for the Browns. Jalen Phillips and the rest of that pass rushing grew a lot of those guys coming off injuries that really stymied them at the end of last season. So worries there offensively we'll see if the line can stay healthy in front of Tua who's going to be asked to shoulder more of the load so yeah I, I don't know we always looked at this Bills team last year dad even when they were at the beginning of the season and they were a 500 ball club and people are wondering about them we looked and said much like the Eagles weren't as good as their 10 and 1 record show the Bills never felt as bad of a team as their 500 record showed and the rest of the season reflected that yeah I, I agree and again when you have Josh Allen you got a shot so sorry, Claudia, I dismissed the Patriots like that, but I think yeah, it's got to be even tough for you, Patriots fans. Well, yeah. senior, the Sox yeah. are supposed to suck too, and they're seven and three right now. So, <laughs> mm. wow, I'm getting Hang there's on. absolutely New no era. crossover there, and I'm very upset. <laughs> and I'm not expecting much, but it's all right. We've won enough. A new era in New England. We'll wait and see if that happens. <laughs> On the path of win totality. But coming up next, speaking of winners, we got a couple to announce in our Beat the Golix bracket and, of course, in the coveted Starch Madness bracket. Next here, we give you both on Gojo and Golik.
All right, guys, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, the third, three quick stories to send you into the rest of the day. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review us. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out live when you can, Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern. If you missed that, you can check out the best of Gojo and Golik on the radio, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear VEASAN on the radio. And if you miss any of it as well, you can check it out on podcasts and hear our great guests. Our thanks to ESPN's Michael Eaves, who's down part of the coverage of the Masters at Augusta for stopping by to get us ready for that. And Jets punter Thomas Morstead getting ready to look ahead at their 2024 season. You can get that wherever you get your podcast or right here on YouTube as soon as we get done. All right, guys, the culmination of a lot we've had going on at this show. When we started March Madness, we know men's and women's basketball were setting to crown a champion, but so were we, and we crowned two, actually. First and foremost, thank you to everybody, both on our production staff who helped make this possible and all you who voted at Gojo and Golik on Twitter. In our Starch Madness bracket, the 32 best fast food items all going head-to-head to try and crown a champion, and we have done that now. The final results are in... We had the sides region, mains region, dessert region, and drinks region that gave way to a finals matchup between McDonald's fries and the Chick-fil-A spicy chicken sandwich. And with 59% of the vote, the McDonald's fries, the one seed in the sides bracket, are your champion in the first year of Starch Madness. Guys, we knew at the start, at the Fry 4, when we were doing a bracket just to find out the one seed in that region, it probably had a good chance. The Golden Arches get to claim this title, Dad. Can't say I'm surprised, so congratulations to a very delicious victor. Tough to beat. True blue blood out here. People, I I would be hard-pressed to find anybody who hasn't at least tried McDonald's fries at some point in their life, let alone had over a million uh, servings of it like I have. So this, and, and, and I do think to Claudia's point, it is, is uh, pretty important that you can eat these fries without ketchup and they still taste pretty good. And a lot of people will dip the chicken spicy, uh, the spicy chicken sandwich in the Chick-fil-A sauce, which is fantastic. So there's that as well. So I voted chicken, uh, uh, the spicy chicken. Claudia, I know you went fries and yours won. Yeah, at the Claudia Belafonte Sportsbook, I have fries like minus 200 to go back to back. So, sorry to everybody wow. else Wouldn't... next year, but I think the fries are just going to run away with it. I don't, I don't see anything stopping them, to be honest. Coming back with the majority of we the core, great same roster, you know. That is true. They're bringing back a lot of talent each and every year, and as long as everything stays consistent with the kitchen staff in there, you have to feel good about the foundation they've laid at that program. It really doesn't matter what workers they've brought through there going all the way back. They've had a good thing going there for a while, and everyone who's come in has been able to put their stamp on it. So, congrats to them. I don't know if we'll be able to go back to the well on this next year. I know One of the other brackets that we kicked around, and based on L. Duncan's recent contributions to this show, March Zadness has a real good chance next year trying to pick the hottest man over 50. And uh, I shudder to think of who people (laughs) might vote for in the one seat in that. I know I'll get a couple of votes anyway. Uh, You know, maybe I'll get a couple of votes. But uh, Fry's Mike wasn't the only winner uh, in in our contests. No, we had the uh, Beat the Golix Bracket Challenge on DraftKings Sportsbook as well. Our pool with a $2,000 bonus bet prize there. And we had it come down to the winner of the final two. It took the UConn-Purdue matchup outcome for it to go off here. And while we still have to go out here and verify everything and verify the standings at the end of the contest here, our preliminary winner looks like at El Llama Picks 24-7 as the unofficial winner right now after UConn pulled that out. So we'll wait to confirm that again. But Dad, in the meantime, before we can officially say that, we can officially say that on this show, after you did a lot of talking, you had to eat a little bit of crow here because as UConn was crowned champion last night, I finished well ahead of you in the rankings in this tournament. What do you got to say for yourself? Uh, uh, listen, I, I'm, I'm not hung up on this competition. If you want to be, you go ahead. If you think that's an important uh, okay. thing that you okay. can say, wow. I be dad. I mean, go ahead. But you know who beat us all is your mother. So yeah. we had four of us involved, me, you, your mother, and your brother, Jake. Jake was a little over twenty, over 21,000 place. I was 18,000 plus. You were 2,000 plus. Your mother was 913th. She was in the top thousand. So you go ahead. You beat me. Congratulations. But uh, I'm sure you'll be getting a call or a text or a FaceTime from your mom talking about how she's the champion. 
My mom has internalized over two decades of sports talk radio at a level most people could not fathom. I am not the least bit surprised that that has turned into her having the best bracket out of our bunch here. So congratulations to Fries, to our unofficial winner of that bracket challenge. We'll have more on that as it becomes official. But Claudia, we got to get to that very interesting situation still kind of in limbo in Kentucky that led to a very funny video of Cal. Yeah, I asked the question. I feel like everybody's asking, can we... For call him the former head coach of Kentucky. Technically, he's still there, John Calipari, but everybody's talking about the fact that he's leaving to go to Arkansas. So we're asking him the question, and a reporter asked him a question while he was walking his dog. The video is amazing to this, so if you're not watching on DKN or YouTube, make sure you go find the video. He responded by saying, no, I don't. I'm walking my dog right now. Coach, you got anything no, you want to say don't. to your fans? I'm watching my anything? dog right anything now. Right now? You want to say yeah, anything to your no, fans I'm good. Right now? I'm good. Come on, Paul. Come on. My dog, my dog is walking me. Come on. And the dog's in the carriage, by the <laughs> ah, so, way. <laughs> yeah. Dog in the was, carriage, yeah. Love Cal as a dog stroller guy, by the way. Anyone who understands their furry friends deserve the utmost comfort in life and will do whatever it takes to take care of them. Good in my book, so good on Cal for that one. But, Dad, this is getting a little weird. Yeah, I think it's going to get done, though. I, I don't think you're this far along in the process to where it's going to stop. Uh, you know, I think the talk now is who's going to take over at Kentucky. I know at ESPN over on their college game day, they were talking about Jay Wright, who was on the on the set with them yeah. about the job. We've heard Nate Oates from Alabama as well. I think this is a done deal. Uh, I think it will be. I heard people complaining, saying you're not walking your dog if your dog's in a stroller. I don't want to hear that nonsense. Sometimes your dog, we got a dog in Hank who's 13, and at some point that's probably how we're going to have to walk him. There's something to just being outside and breathing in the fresh air. It's not about, oh, you're not even walking your dog. I don't want to hear it. Get the dog outside, breathe in the fresh air. If they struggle walking, I love the fact he's out there walking his dog. It's a cool thing. But, yeah, Mike, I, I, don't, I don't see any hang-ups in this. I, I, I think it's going to be a done deal. If anyone out there has slander for the care of senior dogs, <laughs> you're officially an enemy of the program. That's, I'm going to stop myself before I cuss on air because we've already done that once this morning here in Claudia. Instead, <laughs> I'm going to get us to the third here where we have, I think, the final conclusion, maybe dot, 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 question mark in the chiefs of saga. Yeah, this guy's famous now. I guess that was his point. Uh, Chiefsaholic, big fan of the Chiefs. We thought that was all until he got into trouble with the law. So his name's Xavier Babudar. He's ordered to pay $10.8 million to an ex-bank teller that he held at gunpoint in December of 2022. He reached a federal plea agreement in February, admitting to stealing more than $800,000 in 11 robberies across seven states and then laundering the proceeds through casinos. Like I said, he went from a massive fan, they dug a little deeper, and I watched a documentary on it. They said he had a gambling problem, all these things. I, I think it's more than a gambling problem if you are robbing 11 yeah. different banks. <laughs> so, Mike, I got to ask you, and Claudia, I'd ask you too, would you... Mind being, and again, you don't know the outcome, and it could be a bad outcome, be threatened with a gun knowing on the back end you're going to get $10 million. This teller's getting $10.8 million for being threatened with a gun. So would you deal being threatened with a gun not knowing the outcome, but knowing if, if things don't go horribly wrong <laughs> and you're still around that you may pull off a $10 million lawsuit in your favor? So would I rather risk no, I'm good. death? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is this is a little too squid game and dystopian for me. Yeah. There's a commentary to be made that I'll likely <laughs> have to do this for free in my lifetime because this is America and we've let things go pretty sideways on this. What I will say is I would like I almost said this at the end of the Chiefs of Holic saga. I genuinely don't know. I feel like this, for some reason, is going to have another stanza for a man who was robbing banks and then going to tailgate in a wolf costume at Chiefs games. This hardly seems like a guy that's going to go down with the bat on his back right now. We hope you don't either. Go down, downloading, subscribing, rating, and reviewing this show. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow.